Okay, so the first storytelling pitfall that we're concerned about is the idea of manipulation, um, where you don't want to lead the audience to a conclusion that you want. You still need to like follow the analysis and follow the data. Don't just make up data to convince people. And a really fascinating example of this happened a few years ago, um, where This American Life, it's a, a radio show, a podcast, um, did a story about how political scientists used research to discover that you can change people's minds about um, social issues. Um, so previous political science research found that when you go and try to talk to a stranger, talk to a neighbor, and convince them to vote for some topic, um, it's generally not very helpful. If you go tell somebody, you sh so this was in 2015, 2014, they were going around and telling people you should support gay marriage um, and the legalization of gay marriage. Um, what they were trying to do was to see if that was convincing and if, if they somehow convinced a person to support gay marriage, would they still support it three weeks later or two weeks later or some period of time later? And most findings or most research had found that people just go back to, to what they originally thought. And it's really, really hard to change people's minds. Until this researcher came along. He was a PhD student. Um, and what his research was focused on was trying to get lasting change in opinions um, based on interventions or talking to people. Um, and his hypothesis was that if you um, had somebody show up to your house and try to convince you of a policy, and that person was closely connected with that issue. So in their experiment, or in his experiment here, um, he partnered with um, an organization focused on um, gay rights research in California and had gay canvassers go around and talk to people about gay marriage, um, which allowed them to talk about their personal experiences. Um, and so that was the hypothesis, was that having a personalized conversation with somebody who was influenced and affected by that policy, that would lead to lasting change. Um, and he would go around to different conferences and show his results that were coming in live from the field. He had an iPad and he could see like, oh, another canvasser went out. Here's the results. It's holding up. And people loved it at the conferences because it looked really cool. Um, here's his findings. Um, notice that his ggplot. Um, he's doing the same stuff you did. Um, and so what he found here is that when you have direct contact with people who are gay, talking about same-sex marriage, the the support for same-sex marriage stayed high for weeks after that contact. And so the main finding that they had here was that um, this is great. If you want people to be convinced, send people who are the most in, who are the most affected by the policy, and you will create lasting change. And that's what the whole this American Life story was about. It was focused on this this study, and basically the finding was. For activist groups, if you want to have your issue taken up by the public, send people out who are affected by it. Um, but something really interesting happened with this. Um, so a few sessions ago, we talked about um, the Excel error that accidentally caused austerity, um, where PhD students in most political science and econ programs, if you take a stats class, one of your projects is generally to take to find some published paper and replicate it um, so that you can get practice with the different methods that person uses. You can see how it works and it's just a standard replication paper. Um, and so these two PhD students um, decided to replicate um, Michael LeCour's work here because they were interested in it. Um, they were also um, examining similar issues. Um, they were looking also at, at gay marriage issues, but also abortion. Um, they wanted to see if they could um, change attitudes in support of abortion if they sent people out who had had abortions and used them as canvassers. And so they were really interested in this question. So they got the guy's data, um, and then they started analyzing the data, and they noticed that it looked really weird. Um, it looked too perfect. And what they discovered after a whole bunch of poking at it was that Michael LeCour had not actually collected any data. Um, all of his findings were based on fake data. He was simulating stuff, which is what you're doing in the final project. Um, but he was just relying on the simulated data. Um, he did not have contracts with um, gay rights organizations in California. He had kind of invented those. 
um, his iPad that he had that conferences showing live data collection that was all fake too. Um, and so this cool picture here showing that direct contact with um, a gay person increases um, support for gay rights. That is 100% fake right there, which is bad um, for her research um, because it was covered nationally. Um, they had to, it was published in Science, which is like a super top journal. Um, they had to retract it from Science. Um, he was about to start a job at Princeton. They rescinded the job offer and I don't know what he's up to now. Um, but like this was bad. Um, it was also bad because it helped discredit a whole field of research. These two were interested in that same question. Um, but because this fake data thing happened, um, suddenly it looked really bad if anybody was doing something similar. Um, they did, they went and replicated his findings. And what they found here is they, they didn't use gay marriage support because that had changed at that point. It had become legal nationwide. Um, so they couldn't use that exact treatment. But what they did is they, send, uh, they sent people out um, canvassing for um, transgender rights and trying to reduce transphobia. And so what they found is using actual real data, um, they found the same effect, that if people had contact with um, transgender um, canvassers, they were more likely to have a positive um, opinion of trans rights legislation weeks after that interaction. Um, and so they were able to publish their real findings in science, basically saying, like, we can reduce transphobia if we send out trans people who then go talk to people. Um, so it works. It's just that the, this whole liqueur thing messed stuff up and it was bad. Um, so don't do this. This was, this was fun because it happened in like 2015, um, which is right when I was collecting data for my dissertation. Um, and so like I immediately emailed my advisor and was like, all my data is real, I promise. And every, like pretty much all PhD students at that time were doing the same thing. They're like, we're not lying, it's real stuff. Um, because don't lie, that's bad because um, it can ruin stuff. This is a real finding, but it's been hard for them to get traction because it was kind of destroyed accidentally by the fake data. So in the manipulation side of storytelling, don't lie. Um, you're using fake data on purpose to test your models, to make sure the plumbing of the models works. Um, that's great. Don't go and publish the findings with the fake data. That's not great. You need to put the real data in it before you try to publish anything or present anything to people. Don't use fake data in real life. Um, finally, emphasize the story, but make the data available so other people can poke holes at it um, and play with it and see if you're right. Um, and so don't manipulate people. Don't lie um, for the sake of the story. Um, part of the liqueur story there is that the iPad was really cool. Like that kind of took over the storytelling but the data wasn't there, so don't do that. Um, so again, don't manipulate people, don't lie.